Good morning, everyone. The committee welcomes our distinguished guests, Secretary Rumsfeld, joined by General Myers, and we welcome you, Secretary Jonas. Chair will uh, make a very brief opening set of remarks in hopes that we can uh, get to our questions uh, early on and uh, remain on a schedule, which I think provides adequate time, Mr. Secretary, for all members of this committee to have the opportunity to share their views with you and solicit your views. So we meet today to receive the annual testimony of the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, on the posture of the United States Armed Forces and President Bush's defense budget request for fiscal year 2006 and the out-year programs. Secretary Rumsfeld and General Myers, I welcome you back before the committee. And I personally commend you once again for the outstanding leadership you both continue to provide as a team to our nation and indeed the free world in the cause to provide liberty and lead the men and women and their families of our proud armed forces. I shall. Thank you very much. Secretary, we welcome you and Chairman, Secretary Jonas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good morning. Uh, in addition to the chairman, uh, General Dick Myers, and, and the controller and undersecretary Tina Jonas, we also have Dr. David Chu here in the event that questions are appropriate for him. Somewhere in the world, as we speak, young men and women uh, wearing our country's uniform are engaged in the hard work of history. Their families are concerned about their safety and making the best of their loved one's absence. Somewhere a soldier, a sailor, an airman, or a Marine is wounded and determined to get back to duty. And here in our country, hundreds of thousands of dedicated military and civilian personnel are devoting long hours to America's defense. I know that they are comforted and encouraged by the outpouring of support they receive from the American people and from many of you as you have met with them and with the wounded in military hospitals and bases. Their dedication is inspiring, and we thank them for their valor and for their sacrifice. Before discussing dollars and programs and weapons, I'd like to provide some context to the tasks ahead for our country. Consider what's taken place since we met here in early 2001. Two newly free nations, Afghanistan and Iraq, now reside in two of the world's most violent regions. Afghans and Iraqis have held historic elections to choose moderate Muslim leadership. Extremists are under pressure worldwide, their false promises slowly being exposed as another cruel lie of history. America's national security apparatus is seeing historic changes. NATO is undergoing reforms in both organization and mission, expanding its size, deploying forces outside of its traditional European boundaries. And some 60 nations are freshly engaged in an unprecedented multinational effort to halt the proliferation of the world's most dangerous weapons. These issues will no doubt require the focus of U.S. security policies in the years to come. They have and will continue to affect the Department of Defense's pace and direction. When President Bush took office, the country was still savoring victory of the Cold War, the culmination of a long struggle that occupied generations of Americans and leaders of both political parties. There was little appetite to consider the new lethal threats that lingered on as irritants while the country tackled other challenges. The President understood that we were entering an era of the unexpected and the unpredictable and was concerned that our country was not sufficiently prepared. We have confronted and are seeking to meet many challenges, including the challenge of having to move military forces rapidly around the globe, the urgency of functioning as a truly joint force as opposed to simply keeping the various military services out of each other's way through deconfliction. The need to recognize that we're engaged in a war and yet still functioning under peacetime constraints, regulations, requirements against an enemy that is unconstrained by laws or bureaucracies. The need to adjust to a world where the threat is not from one superpower, but from rogue regimes and extremist cells that can work together, share information, and proliferate lethal capabilities. 
The questions many of us wrestled with back then to deal with these challenges are still relevant today. For example, are the armed services properly organized to deal with the uncertainties we faced? We realized that the military services, Cold War arrangements were ill-suited for the new warfare of the future structure in light of the technological advances of the last decade. Technological advances and better organization have allowed the military to generate considerably more combat capability with the same or in some cases fewer numbers of weapon platforms. Let me describe a, a few examples. Where once the Air Force and Navy planned in terms of sorties per target, they now assign targets per sortie. As the chart indicates to my right, in 1982, and even during Operation De Desert Storm, we were down around 175 um, aircraft per target, uh, targets per day, I should say, and it took multiple aircraft to do achieve a target. Uh, in Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, targets per day has gone up to 650, so it's, it's gone up some three plus times. I thank you, Mr. Secretary. I felt it important that today's record reflect the very significant contribution that uh, the Department of Defense is making towards our homeland defense. And I judge from your comments that you feel that everything that can be done is being done. It is a, um, I think uh, the way I would phrase it is we, we watch I, not we, the department, but intelligence, counterintelligence people watch what people do, and they, they watch what we do. And as we develop defenses against certain types of potential attacks, uh, they develop techniques that are different to get around those defenses. So I would never want to suggest that it's a static situation. It's dynamic, it's active, it's continuing, and, and the task is to constantly stay ahead of their decision cycles in those adjustments so that we're aware of the changes they're making in their plans. I thank you very much. I think hopefully that provides reassurance. General, do you wish to add? To I that? would like, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add a, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, obviously, we don't do this alone, and if you think as I do, that perhaps the most important thing the department can do is to um, work this problem away from our shores uh, rather than respond to it once it reaches our shores, which is important, and we can do that, uh, then our work with our friends and allies and partners around the world is very important. We have good cooperation with Pakistan. They have done a great job in putting pressure on uh, the Al-Qaeda in the, uh, the, the federally administrated tribal areas, the Fatah and uh, continue to do that. And that disrupts their ability to plan uh, for attacks anywhere in the world, but the U.S. would be included there. So, uh, and I would, I would say in Afghanistan, we have good cooperation with the Afghanistan government. Uh, Saudi Arabia just hosted a counterterrorism conference, first time ever, well attended by uh, many, many nations, and uh, has some promise for to continue to take, take this fight to where the enemy is and uh, keep them from coming to the shores of our friends and allies. Thank you, General. Senator McCain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for appearing again. Uh, but if we have four ships a year purchased, we're down over time exactly. to 120 ship Navy, and I'm not sure that can in any way meet our obligations and responsibilities. Do you want to say something, General Myers? Uh, Senator McCain, if I may, I'd like to talk about the insurgent numbers. We've, we've had this discussion before, and let me, let me just give you my view of it. Um, as you look at the intelligence estimates, they, they are wide ranges, I would say, and, and we can show you those. Uh, I'm not sure the insurgents know how many insurgents there are, because the structure over there is not – they don't have a central organization. They're networked. They're small cells. So as you – pick up insurgents and you debrief them and you find what they have in their, in their rooms and on their computers, you don't find the wiring diagram because I don't think it exists like, like we would exist. So it's, it makes estimating very hard. But there are some things we do know. We essentially know what their capability is. And I would characterize it, and this is in terms of insurgency, insurgencies that we've seen in, in history, it's limited. Uh, they have limited capacity. We've tracked the number of attacks per day, and what they can do is 50 to 60 attacks, I'm sorry, yes, per day, that they're able to conduct countrywide with spikes. And that seems to be, it seems to be their capacity. Um, 
we know in terms of insurgency that they're, they have lost or are badly losing the, the hearts and minds issue with the Iraqi people, and we know that. And, and it's an important part when you're talking about insurgencies. And I think the future looks bleak for him. And I'll just, I talked to General Casey this morning on, on another matter, uh, but he mentioned, he said, the Iraqi people since elections are more confident in their security forces than they've ever been. He says, more importantly, the Iraqi security forces are confident in their ability because they performed, as you know, very well during the election period and in times since. He says, the Sunni leadership, he said, the ones that he talks to and from talking to other Iraqis, uh, they now understand they missed a, an opportunity that was very important to them to participate in the elections. And so they're looking for ways to, to participate now in the political process. And I think that all goes into those, those numbers. I think as Sunni leaders join the political uh, environment and, and process that, that we'll see a lot of those folks that are on the fence come off. So that's why I think you see that wide, wide range. Of the hardcore that have to be captured or killed, there are some hardcore that are going to have to be captured or killed. Uh, those numbers, I think, are, are a small percentage of the overall that wide range we see. And Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator McCain, those are two. General Myers, in, in your uh, prepared statement, you note that the combatant commanders and the services continue to identify preferred uh, munition shortfalls as one of their areas of concern. And, and uh, obviously, I'm pleased that supplemental funding has boosted production of the laser-guided bombs and the JDAMs, the Joint Direct Attack Munitions. But as you point out, we need to continue to fund long-term development of those types of weapons. Yet in this budget, we see the Joint Common Missile Program and the Wind Corrected Munitions Dispenser Extended Range Program being terminated in the Navy request and funding uh, for JDAMs and LGBs declining under the program number. So aren't, aren't we there um, under funding uh, investment in something desperately needed or valuably used these days? Senator Lieberman, it's, it's absolutely correct that we need to, to fund the right munitions, and, and we've been very fortunate, thanks to Congress, to be able to plus up the two accounts you mentioned, the laser-guided and the yeah. Joint Direct Attack Mission. We appreciate that. On the Joint Common Missile, the issue was there. We, we had a program that was having having trouble in terms of cost and schedule. And it got to the point where it was decided maybe we need to start again at this. In the meantime, uh, the missiles that it was re going to replace, the Hellfire missile for our helicopters, the Maverick missile for some of our fixed-wing aircraft, and P3s, I think our inventories of those are something like 20,000 and 15,000 roughly. So we have the capability today. Joint Common Missile was going to try to take technology to the next leap and they decided to take a step back since it was performing uh, badly. On the wind corrected munitions dispenser, we do have the wind corrected mission dispenser. We don't have the long range version is what was, uh, was impacted here. And I think that's something we ought to look at in the QDR and see how it fits in our overall concept of operations. I don't, I don't know that it's a concern right now, but it, but it, but it absolutely uh, could be. Other than that, I'm, I think we're, I'm pretty satisfied with, our, with the level of our munitions. Now, um, having them uh, distributed in the right places and all that is something we work yeah. daily. But uh, we have really increased our, our inventories over the last couple of years, and we're continuing to reduce that gap between our requirements and, and, uh, and the inventory. Uh, I thank you. My, my time is up. I just say very briefly that, that this, I think this question of long-term investment has to be a priority for us. I hope, I hope and, and trust it will be for the coming QDR. One way to deal with this is to produce, as Admiral Clark said, m more ships that cost less money to meet the need. Uh, in other words, a di different way to uh, achieve efficiencies, and the same is true throughout the uh, department. I think you heard Senator McCain indicate that in, in the early uh, subcommittee, he and I hope to focus on uh, helping the department do that as well. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Let me add one more thought, Senator Lieberman. Yes, that sir. is, as you look at <coughs> procurement budgets, <coughs> excuse me, as you look at procurement budgets, uh, also look at the supplemental because there's uh, several billions of dollars in the supplemental that will help uh, recapitalize some of our, our capabilities. And I'm thinking about uh, helicopters and I'm thinking about vehicles primarily. And, and if you add that total to our procurement budget, then you get a you get a, a stronger a stronger read on that. I've noticed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Levin. Thank you. Um, on the question of the death benefit, General, um, 
As the chairman mentioned, the vice chiefs were here the other day. Uh, I participated in pressing them for direct answers. It was not typical of me to press people for those kind of answers, I but I, I made an exception. Yes, sir. And uh, ask the vice chiefs for their position uh, on the whether or not the the military death gratuity should be the same for all members who die on active duty in service to their country, and they gave us their best professional opinion, and I'm wondering if you would give us your opinion. Sir, my opinion with, with uh, the knowledge that I have right now is that uh, I think a death gratuity that applies to all service members is preferable to one that one is targeted just to those that might be in a combat zone. There was an article yesterday. Now that would imply all back here um, in Connors, is that correct? Absolutely. In, in my mind... And my supposing that individual were on uh, a weekend pass and had the misfortune doesn't matter. You know, a motorcycle the, accident or something? doesn't matter, uh, the, in my mind. And the reason it doesn't, I have a hard time differentiating in my mind somebody that raises their right hand, swears to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. One person goes to Iraq and is tragically killed. Yeah. One person goes to the National Training Center and is is killed two weeks before they report to Iraq and trying to explain to uh, some family member why there's why there's a difference. Uh, when you join the military, you join the military. You go where they send you. Uh, and it's happenstance that you're in a combat zone or you're at home. And I think we have in the past uh, held to treating people universally for the most part and, uh, and consistently and that's, that's how I come down on that. And the pain and suffering by that widow here at home is no less than the one for the widow who lost her Family needs overseas. remain the same, you bet. Uh, well, tough he, issue, and I thank you. Excuse it me. It is a tough issue. 11. I appreciate you. Well, I want to thank you for your, your answer, and you're going to find a lot of support here, including myself, uh, for that position. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, I asked a question yesterday, and this will be my final question. Uh, uh, I asked a question yesterday of um, FBI Director Mueller relative to the... Um, events that occurred in late 2002 and mid... Uh, in terms of what that disclosed, the Department of Defense was aware, as I just said, aware of most of them previously because there had been allegations that had been previously being investigated and either closed or are still open. Uh, and sometimes they're closed because they weren't valid, sometimes they're closed because they're prosecuted. You say Department of Defense was aware, that means you were aware? I think that's, if, if you're suggesting that everything that's going on no, in the Department some of Defense I'm aware of, no, no, the I'm answer, not. The answer is no. No, but just, in, just to try to get this in a, in a context, there, there was a really heated debate going on, according to those emails, in, in late 02 up to mid 03, between... Oh, I, that subject. I yeah. thought you, when you said those allegations, no, you yeah. mean broadly. Yeah. Yes, I no, was ad, aware. Ad Gitmo, you, yes, you, you I was were aware of that. I had heard of that of that, at yes. that time. Close proximity. That's fair enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General uh, Jonas. I think we've had an excellent hearing. I hope you share that view with me. And we look forward to continuing uh, the strong cooperative effort we have between this committee and your department. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 